We did begin last week talking about a kingdom of priests, which is a concept that comes to us by way of the Exodus in the 19th chapter, 5th and 6th verses, when God told Israel they'd be a kingdom of priests to him, a holy nation. But it also is applied to us by Peter in 1 Peter chapter 2, in his uh, opening verses there, as well as, uh, well, it's really the theme there, it follows through, that we as Christians are priests, and we are as priests in the business of doing basically two things. We make sacrifices, and we teach the religion of God, the law of God. That's what priests do. If you um, were you know, blessed enough to have Bible classes when you were a child, they probably talked about Levitical priests and what are the jobs and duties of the priests, you know, and there's basically these two things. They make the offerings and they teach the law. That's what priests do, and that is correct. And since we are priests, that's what we do too. We make offerings in our own lives, which is what we talked about last time, but we also are to be teaching the law of God, and that would mean teaching those who are round about us, teaching others in the way that we live. We, we can see in Exodus 19 when God says to Israel they will be a kingdom of priests, that he says this in the midst of all the nations, that all of the earth belongs to him, and every nation, therefore, is a matter of importance with him. It means that Israel is intended to teach all of those who are around about them. And to follow that pattern today as a Christian, we are intended to teach all of those who are around us. That's the pattern as found in Scripture. And I mention again the Revelation in chapter 5, verses 9 and 10. John captures there that we who sing a new song include this verse, you've made them a kingdom and priests to our God and they shall reign on the earth, which is to say it is our service today, our service here and now as priests of God. So we want to say that first at the outset. So just as much as it is important for us to live holy and to live right, to know what is right, to offer sacrifices of our own lives, our own effort, our own money, uh, and time, so also it is the job of the priest to teach. So, as I thought about what does that, you know, <laughs> what does that entail? Well, we'll go into Acts chapter 26 here. What does that entail? What's, the, what's with the teaching? I really do think that Teaching comes down to attitudes. And I realize attitude is a little bit of a weasel word. You know, you can make it mean a lot of things. You can change that definition up. I get that. But I think the, our attitude towards other people, especially, is very important to our ability to teach other people. Our attitudes about them, our attitudes about God's word and the power of it, or the lack thereof, is a critical matter when it comes to teaching. And I think that's probably the most important thing when it comes to teaching the lost, as they, they say it, teaching the lost. Um, you know, you can't hide what you really think. It's going to come through. You know, people say, well, you know, watch your words and uh, be, be careful what you say, you know, not to, uh, you know, not to give away a, a disdain or a, a disrespect for them or thinking of them as less intelligent or less than or whatever. And, you know, be careful how you word things, you know. And I understand, you know, that probably has good intentions behind it, but it's just completely wrong. The fact is, you cannot hide how you really feel about them. If you don't want to give off an air of superiority, then you have to not think you're superior. 
If you want to not offend people, you have to be not offensive. If you want them you know, to know that you care about them, well, you have to care about them. But this is the thing. You can't hide how you really feel. Now, maybe for a moment, maybe for a time, but if you're going to teach and you're going to reach, if you live in and among, if you work with people, they know who you are. They know what you think. Whether, you know, you're one of them or whether you're above them, whether you, you know, relate or are aloof, whether you think that there are good things about them or they really have nothing to offer, nothing to say, nothing of use to us. They can tell. People know that without necessarily a single word. So I think the attitude is very important. Well, the problem with attitude, of course, is how do we fix it? And how do we, you know, how do we set that? And how do we know? I think that the answer to this is, is what we're about to do here. So it's, the first thing we have to believe is that God can bring anybody back. God can bring anybody back. Whatever their circumstances, whatever their situation is, whatever they have done in the past or maybe are engaged in at the moment, it doesn't have to be like that. In my case, in your case, in anybody's case, it doesn't have to be that way. This is what Paul said in Acts 26 when he stood in court and they wanted to know why he was appealing to go to Caesar as if he's got some accusation against the nation Israel, his own people, and he does not, and he's making very plain that he does not have a complaint against Israel. Although they do have this disagreement where he says in the sixth verse, I now stand and am judged for the hope of the promise made by God to our fathers. To this promise our 12, 12 tribes earnestly serving God night and day hope to attain. And in the eighth verse, he says, most importantly, why should it be thought incredible by you that God raises the dead? Yeah, why should that be thought incredible? Cannot be believed, not to be believed that God raises the dead. Perfectly valid question in the context that Paul's asking it, but it's valid for our attitude, see. When it comes to teaching and to preaching and to reaching. Why should it be thought incredible that God raises the dead? Why should any of us think that a leopard can't change his spots? That's what they say, you know. They say a leopard can't change his spots. Is that what you believe? You know? They say, oh, you know, those people, they're a lost cause. You know, don't waste your time on them. Is that what you believe about it? Now they say this is a dying religion, you know. <laughs> is that what you believe? This is a dying religion? Uh, if I believed what they say, I'd be no Christian. I'd be no preacher, let alone, you know, no Christian, let alone a preacher. No. No, I don't believe that. God raises the dead. Don't you believe that? Things can change. People can change. That's the first thing you've got to believe, that the leopard does change his spots. There is no such thing as someone who is a lost cause. And there is a hope for us and for the congregation. Because God raises the dead. You know, whatever we face, whatever happens, whatever, whatever besets us, you know, it can only add up to death, you know. <laughs> they say death by paper cut, right? Paper cuts are so small, but, you know, as many as it takes for you to die. Well, okay, but all they can add up to is death. Why does that matter? Because God raises the dead. They can't do anything to beat God. It can't overcome him. We cannot be so far gone that God can't save us through the, the blood of his son, Jesus. It doesn't exist. So the first thing that we have to understand and, and really to believe, truly believe this, 
is that there's potential in everybody around us. Yes, they're dead and their sins and their trespasses now, but they don't have to stay that way. It doesn't have to be like that. Maybe they've never heard this before. Maybe they don't know the gospel. Maybe they don't know there's somebody nearby who has the truth. Don't you believe God raises the dead? Why is that incredible? And no, I'm not saying the power is in me or in you. I'm saying the power is in God. He raises the dead. Why would we limit his power? First thing. But let's look through the rest of this here. 2 Corinthians 5, we move on here in the thought. So what about God's attitude towards this? Well, there's a few things that I wanted to bring out. There are some fairly obvious things, as John 3.16, for example, that God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him should not be lost or should not perish but have eternal life. True, God had enough, um, I guess, faith, for lack of a better word, he had enough faith in humanity to send his son. He knew there would be some who would obey him. But 2 Corinthians 5 is the first thing I grabbed here that is just to say that the idea, the concept of reconciliation comes to us by way of God himself. He's the one who came up with the idea that we can be reconciled, that our differences don't, are not permanent. When he said in the 17th, 2 Corinthians 5, 17 through 19, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Now all things are from God, who has reconciled us to himself through Jesus Christ and given to us apostles the ministry of reconciliation. That is, that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not imputing their trespasses to them, and he's committed to us apostles the word of reconciliation. This whole idea of sending these apostles with this word, this reconciliation in his son Jesus, this is from God. He's the one who made it. And just as he created the earth, he creates you and me when we obey the gospel. You are a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, all things are new. When you are a Christian, you're a new creation, a new person. It starts all over again. This we have from God, not from ourselves. We're not relying on our own Cells on our own power, on our own goodness, we're relying, we are relying on God and the promises he's made. Over in the letter to Titus, we have that second chapter, Paul writing the probably young preacher about the nature of God's grace in this world, saying to him in the 11th verse of the second chapter of Titus, the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all people, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly desires, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in the present age, which is what we read in Revelation. We are priests on earth. We reign on earth. But the grace of God has appeared, yes, and it brings salvation for all people. God's grace reaches me, we sing sometimes. But God's grace does something specific in that 12th verse. It appears and it teaches us, trains us, that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly. God provides the training. He came up with the idea that we should be reconciled to him, and he also provides the training for everyone to be reconciled to him, to live right, right now. And later here in the third chapter, remind them, he says to us, telling the, young, the, the evangelist Titus, here's what you need to do in the local church. Titus 3, 1 through 6. Remind them to be subject to rulers and authorities, to obey, to be ready for every good work, to speak evil of no one, to be peaceable, gentle, showing all humility to all men. This is where... It really came, became clear to me that our attitude is the most important thing. 
We ourselves were also once foolish, disobedient, deceived, serving various lusts and pleasures, living in malice and envy, hateful and hating one another. Yes, we ourselves were like that before we obeyed the gospel. But when the kindness and the love of God, our Savior toward man, appeared, he, not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us through the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us abundantly through Jesus Christ, our Savior. The grace that he began to speak about in the second chapter is this kindness that has come from God, but this kindness is something that we take and embody in the way that we treat other people. Show perfect courtesy, he said. Perfect courtesy to all. Humility towards all. Yes, our attitude is very, very important. Remember that we were once foolish, disobedient, deceived. It's not an intellectual exercise, you understand. It's where the heart is and whether you've heard the word of God yet. We were in that position at one time. Have some mercy. And God saved us, as it says, not because of good things, right things that we ourselves have done, but because of his mercy. We needed salvation too. We needed forgiveness too. And yes, 1 Corinthians 6, how could you miss that one? You have to do that one. The Greeks, you know, Corinth is in Greece. The Greeks have a terrible reputation in the ancient world that they were just filthy. They were filthy McNasty. Just all kinds of horrible, <laughs> unthinkable sexual immorality. They had... You know, you know how the Eskimos, they say they had, what is it, 50 words for snow? Yeah. The Greeks had a word for every kind of sexual perversion you can think of, and some that have never occurred to you. <laughs> they had a word for it. That's the way they were. They were known for this. So when Paul writes to Corinth, of course, the Corinthians were Greeks. They did a lot of things in their past lives where he says to them, beginning at the ninth verse of 1 Corinthians 6, Don't you know the unrighteous won't inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor homosexuals, nor sodomites, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners will inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you. Such were some of you. Were what? We're fornicators, we're adulterers, we're homosexuals, we're sodomites, we're drunkards, we're extortioners. What's an extortioner? This is somebody who takes uh, advantage, who, who, who uh, makes a grab uh, for cash or for liberty or for power. So what is that? That's going to be a drug dealer, a cartel, organized crime, um, you know, corruption in government office, uh, you know, somebody who takes advantage. They were like this. Such were some of you. And it's important to understand that certainly they were. How could they not be? They're Greeks. But you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. We, you know, we are told today in our society that, you know, I was born this way, God made me this way. Like your choice of how you uh, fulfill your sexual desire or what you find to be attractive or what you uh, find to be uh, uh, desirable in the American popular religion has to be part of your DNA. You were born with it. It couldn't possibly be a matter of taste, and there's no accounting for taste. No. 
Because America is basically a Calvinist country in the Puritan idea that you are born sinful and that flesh is inherently sinful and you can't help but do wrong, that is very much ingrained in modern American thinking, even among the atheists. All the identity politics, it's nothing but Calvinism. I was born this way. God made me this way. And yet the scripture says, and such were some of you. Now, it's just a practice. As that goes, without getting too far afield, the Greeks knew that too. They saw these different ways, different things that they could engage in as appropriate at different stages of life. That's how they saw it. <laughs> Homosexuality was for the young unmarried man when he was in the armed services especially. But once he gets mature and is settled down and to marry about age 30, that's, you know, that's a childish. He shouldn't be doing that anymore. Now it's time to do this. That's the way they thought about it. It was not ingrained in them and in their thinking. And I don't want it to be ingrained in our thinking. Because what it comes down to is God is greater than all of this. He can free anybody from any of these things and more. That's my point here, is Calvinism is wrong. American attitudes are wrong. Expel them from your mind. God is greater than all of these. We can get free from these things and more. The members of the church at Corinth, they used to do these things, but they don't do them anymore because now they're Christians. They're a new creature created in Christ Jesus. Well, let me move on. But the attitude, I think, is very important. That's the thing that needs to be said first because you can't hide how you really feel about people. If you think that there's hope in them, if you think there's some good things they do, and those are the things that ought to be capitalized upon, that's where we should start and we should build and we should talk. Well, they'll know that. And they'll listen. They'll talk to you. Oh, maybe, not, you know, is everyone going to agree? No. Is everybody going to obey today? No. But they might obey in time. You never know. You don't know who's listening. You don't know who's watching. Um, but I know no one is listening if I think that I'm better than them, if I think they're a lost cause, if I think there's just no point in talking to them. Yeah, they, they certainly have nothing to listen to then. And why should they? You know, what would be the benefit of becoming a member of a church that thinks you're less than? That's not what it's for, is it? Let's talk in Matthew 13 about the value of truth. Jesus said these things in Matthew 13. Just two parables here, but I want to take a look at them kind of quickly. But they get across something that we've got to take to heart. Matthew 13, 44, the kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field which a man found and covered up. Then in his joy, he goes and sells all that he has and buys that field. The kingdom of heaven is like that. What is this? The kingdom of heaven, it's the church. But what is the church? Well, it's the assembly of the people who worship God. And they come to know God by faith, but faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God, Romans 10, 17. The gospel is the power of God to salvation, Romans 1, 16. The kingdom of heaven is the church. It's the truth. The truth is what he finds. It's like hidden in a field, but it's a treasure, the truth is. A man found this thing and he covered it up. Well, sometimes the truth comes to you, you know. <laughs> You're just minding your own business, and some Christian says something to you, or, or some, somehow you decide to pick up a Bible and you read it, and you become aware of this thing. And whoa, that's different. That's a treasure. This isn't like anything else. But I would say, shouldn't a Christian be the, the way that this happens in some people's lives? I think so. Shouldn't it be you and me, the ones who are the who are, you know, putting this in front of them so they can trip on it? <laughs> he covered it up is to say he's honest. He's not a thief. He's going to get this by legal appropriate means, right? But 
The point is that he's listening. He knows that it's there, and so he goes in joy because he knows the value of the hidden treasure is greater than everything. He knows it, and that makes him happy. Truth does make you happy when you discover it. I'll tell you that. If you're looking for the truth, if you want to know what God wants, and then you see it, you find it, that's a joyous thing. It is, and it's worth everything. He sells all that he has. He's made up his mind. He's determined. I'm getting rid of everything because I'm going to buy that because that is worth all. All that he has, he buys that field. The rights to this treasure replaces everything that he had before. Right? That's all we're saying. The truth is greater, is more valuable than anything you've got when you don't know it. So people sometimes are going to react this way, you know. They just didn't know. They'd never heard. They didn't realize. You spur them to reading the Bible, and they will discover this sometimes. And then, man, you can't stop them. <laughs> Try to keep them from obeying. You can't. And then in the 45th and 46th verses, the very next verses, he said, again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant in search of fine pearls, who on finding one pearl of great value went and sold all he had and bought it. It's very similar. But these are pearls of wisdom, you see. Trade the, the wisdom of this world for real wisdom, the wisdom from God. It's what is happening here. This merchant is a dealer. He deals in pearls. This is somebody who cares about wisdom, who maybe is looking for truth, who wants to know what God wants from him or her. They're looking in search of fine pearls. As in, I hear what this one says. I hear what this one says. I've read that. I've read this. This philosophy, that philosophy, this religion, that religion. Have you read the Bible yet? Well, I haven't. But you're in search of fine pearls. When you read the Bible, you find the one pearl of great value. That's the one that excels them all. That's the one that's better than everything that came before and after. And though he has a collection of fine pearls, there's only one like this. And this one is so much more valuable that it's worth the entire collection of fine pearls. All the wisdom of this world doesn't add up to the wisdom of God. So he sells it and buys. It's worth everything. The point of it is just this. The truth is valuable to those who value it. Yeah, there's going to be people who don't listen. I understand that. And there are people who don't value the truth or who don't value it right now, as far as you know. But don't forget, you know, sometimes the truth is met with opposition in your mind the first time you come across it because nobody likes to be wrong and nobody likes to be cross-examined or called into question. And the gospel does that to you. Certainly, I reacted negatively the first time I heard the truth, and it was very much my heart's intent and goal and purpose in reading the Bible. The reason that I read it was to prove wrong the person who told me that I wasn't living right. <laughs> I said, I'm going to read this thing and beat him at his own game. He's not smarter than me. I'll read it, and I'll prove him wrong. That's what I intended to do. But, of course, when I read it, well, he wasn't wrong. The truth is, when I read the Bible for the first time, I realized, this is not what I've been doing. How did I not know this? And maybe somebody will do that. Uh, there was a, there, well, there still is a very faithful brother who used to be one of our deacons years ago. Uh, you know, his first response to the truth was to slam the door on the person who was talking to him about the Bible. Um, but no, eventually he obeyed the gospel. Eventually he came around, yeah. And as I say, he served as a deacon here at South Austin, faithful, and he's still a faithful brother. Just, you know, relocated, that's all. But the truth is valuable to those who value it. 
But the parables are telling us that the truth is worth sacrificing for. They sold everything they had, and it was worth it. The parables are telling us the truth is more important than anything, and the truth is more important than the combination of everything. Proverbs 23, 23, buy truth and do not sell it. Buy wisdom, instruction, and understanding. There's no price on truth. It's more important than anything. It's more important than everything. And if somebody values truth and they come across truth, they're going to be that person, that man who stumbles across a hidden treasure, who realizes its value. They're going to be that merchant in search of fine pearls, perhaps. They want to know. And when they see it, they'll know it. Jesus said, my sheep hear my voice. Jesus said, ask and you will receive. Knock and it will be open. Seek and you will find. That's a promise about your ability to find God, your ability to know what is right, your ability to become a Christian. In closing, we're going to Acts chapter 2. I'm going to just give you some closing thoughts here. Acts chapter 2. But the question becomes, where should they go? There's people who don't know the truth or people who come to know the truth but have not yet obeyed. They don't maybe they have some questions. They want to know more. They want to grow. They need to grow. They need to, to, to learn some things. Where should they go? And can they come here? As we said before, is this the kind of place? Are we the kind of people that can and should receive those who want to know the truth, who want to learn, who are not yet Christians but want to be or want to know what this is about? Is it the kind of place? Well, the kind of place it was when the apostles first started is recorded for us in Acts 2 and at verse 44 it said, all who believed were together and had all things in common and sold their possessions and goods and divided them among all as anyone had need. So continuing daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house, they ate their food with gladness and simplicity of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved. Now, they had an unusual circumstance that these people were foreigners who were in town for, you know, a long stay, but not, you know, to move to Israel. But now they're going to be moving to Israel. And so they're selling off their foreign holdings and distributing that, which is to say, in his joy, he goes and sells all that he has, right? Right? so that he can get this one, the truth, the real church of Christ. They had glad hearts, it said. That 40, uh, 46th verse is saying something that's maybe not that clear uh, in translation that I want to make a point of. Luke is showing us that they gathered in the temple daily, but that they they ate common meals at home. Which is to say they worshiped together, but also they did know each other outside of church. And then it says there, in mind, it says they ate their food. Uh, that's New King James. The English Standard says they received their food, but the word food there is not the usual word for food. This is the word that means sustenance or nourishment. So Luke is making a play on words. Whether they did this at church as they had the fellowship of the saints or whether they had a new outlook on just regular old life, giving thanks for the food that they have, the government that they have, the blessings of life they have. One way or the other, they accepted 
the spiritual and the physical sustenance that came to them from God. And it made them generous with others, and it gave God the praise. They had gladness. They had contentment. Yes, that's possible. <laughs> Indeed, it should characterize Christians. Yes, it said they had favor with all the people at verse 47. A good reputation was theirs. Yes, that's possible. <laughs> Why couldn't the church have a good reputation? Why couldn't the community know about the church and know, hey, something real is there, something is happening there, that's different, that's unique? Why not? It happened here. The Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. You know, those who loved the truth, they came and joined these people. Yes, that is possible. Of course that's possible. See above. God raises the dead. You know, they had joy, they had gladness, they had contentment. The things happening in this life, the, the, the losses of this life, they just didn't mount up to overcome the joy that there was at the forgiveness of sins, the fellowship of the saints, the hope of eternal life. It wasn't enough to overcome that. They had joy, they had gladness, they had generosity. They had favor with people. There was a good reputation. They were known. And those who loved the truth, they knew where to go. They came here. Is that possible today? Of course it's possible today. Yes. Of course it is. I dare say in a lot of ways it's true. It depends on who you ask, you know. <laughs> well, if you ask the devil, there's nothing but problems here, of course, you know. It's a dying religion. Of course he'd say that. <laughs> but don't listen to that. If you ask the devil's servants, they don't want you talking to us. They don't want you to talk to members of Salon. They don't want you to know that people go there. They don't want you to know that that place even exists anymore. Yeah, there's a reputation for sure. It does exist. But what about in the community? And what about those who need to be saved? Those who need to know the truth. Those who are our friends, our neighbors, our co-workers, our family. Yes, as a kingdom of priests, we all are supposed to be teaching. We're all supposed to be reaching. We make these sacrifices in our own lives of right living, it's true, but we also should be the one who knows how to answer, who knows how to offer the book, to get people to turn to the book, to know that the book has the answers. That's your main thing, you know. You're not, you're not charged with knowing the answers to everybody's question. And you're certainly not charged with knowing everything about every world religion and having some, you know, debate response to it. Forget that. You're supposed to know the truth yourself so that you can give an answer for the hope that's within you. As in, why do you have this hope? You keep yourself back from these things which would be a pleasure, but you don't do it. Why? Well, you should know why. Well, I don't do that because I have a better hope. No, your job is to tell people where the answers are. You don't need to know all the answers. You need to know where the answers are. And where is that? The Bible. The Bible has the answers. The Bible is right. Let's go to the Bible together. That's what people need. And if they read that book, they'll see what they need to do. God will take care of that. <laughs> oh, yes, he will. God will take care of that. Don't you worry. He knows exactly where they are. He will reach them right where they're at. If they need to be hit right between the eyes, he's good at that too. Don't worry. Just point them to the scriptures. But our attitude has to be such that we can reach them. And our attitude has to be such that this would be a place. Why would God bless this place if it weren't somewhere that people could obey the gospel? If it were not somewhere people could come to learn, if they couldn't have a gentle response, if they didn't have kindness and charitable deeds, why would God send somebody there? 
just to be dejected and sad, rejected and pushed away. Why would he send them there? That doesn't make sense. Let's strive to be what God wants us to be, to be that priest, the kind of priest that God calls for, the kind of priest that Jesus set an example of. If today you're not a Christian, become a Christian. We have water prepared that you might be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for forgiveness of sins, which is right there in Acts 2 in verse 38. Are you a Christian already but have not lived right? Repent. Come back to God. If we can pray with you, if we can help you to be baptized, please let your need be known now by coming to the front while we stand and sing the song that is selected. That song.